And welcome, everybody, to another episode of Sports Talk for You. My name is Aaron Bell. I have my co-host Adam Parker and Armand Ely with us. We have a very special guest that is well known around the Wichita State Nation, former legendary co- pitching coach Brent Kimnitz from Wichita State. Hello, Brent. How's it going? Good, man. How are you guys today? We're doing, doing great. well. Glad buddy. to have you. Doing great. Glad you could make it on the show with us today. Hey, my pleasure. I got plenty of time right now. <laughs> well, that's <good>. awesome. <laughs> we know that you love baseball and with all the stuff that happened this year with Eric Wedge's first year and just all the pandemic stuff just didn't work out the way we wanted it. Um, let's go ahead and just start off talking. Do you think Eric Wedge will get this program back to what it was when you and Gene Stevenson were coaching for the last 30 years? I have no doubt in my mind. He, uh, his record speaks for itself. I mean, he was a catcher on our national championship team, great leader. Uh, as the pitching coach during that time frame, we had an amazing run of catchers. I think six of our guys actually caught in the big leagues. But as far as we're handling a, a pitching staff and being a leader on the team, uh, he's probably the best we ever had. And he went on to, you know, play in the big leagues. Um, injuries cut that short. But uh, it was a no-brainer in my mind that he was going to be successful if he stayed in the game, which we all hoped he would because he has so much to give back. Uh, and he was on the fast track as a minor league manager. Uh, and then within three or four years, he was one of the youngest, I think maybe even the youngest manager ever, like 33 or 34. Uh, to manage in the big leagues with Cleveland. In 2007, he's American League Manager of the Year. Uh, Went on, he was with them seven years. I think he managed with uh, Seattle for three. So 10-year big league manager, 07 Manager of the Year in the American League. Um, It it was a no-brainer hire when the position became available. Uh, Eric Wedge, you know, with with his background here as a catcher, and then his managing record in the minor leagues and for sure in the big leagues, uh, it, it, was a, it was a home run iron. We're all excited. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, put Todd Butler under the bus, but I know when he was hired onto that six-year contract, there was a lot of threats towards um, our AD at the time. I forgot his name. Uh, Eric Sexton. There was a lot of threats towards him for making that hire. Do you think, Eric Wedge would have took the job seven years ago if they would have reached out to him? Well, I was I was one of them uh, searching for a new coach. So when the change was made and they kept me, um, I was one of the guys that was reaching out to people. People were obviously reaching out to me. One of my very first phone calls was Eric Wedge. He was the manager of the Seattle Mariners. That was 2013. And me and him, had, we had a great relationship. You know, when I was pitching coach and he was our catcher on our national championship team, we'd stayed in touch. Uh, he had had me come out and speak to some different, you know, organizations. He is a, so we were really, really close. Um, so I called him and I said, hey, you know, I'm sure you're well aware a change is being made. I feel fortunate they've kept me, but we're looking for a head coach. I said, you want the job? So he kind of laughed because he's the manager for the Seattle Mariners. I said, hey, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but if he had said yes, it would have been a no-brainer. It wasn't going to be my decision. It was going to be, you know, athletic director Eric Sexton's decision. But if I would have gone to Eric and said, hey, Wedge will take the job, that would have been a no-brainer. I think everybody knows, you know, what he meant to Wichita State baseball. So he kind of laughed and he said, well, thanks for saying that, but I'm kind of busy right now. He even shared that story at his press conference. So he, he was reached out to, and his, you know, after, you know, reaching out saying, is this something you would do? He said, just get the best guy. You know, a lot of people were keeping the family, uh, go with the shocker, which there were some good options there, but he said, get the best guy. So we did a ton of research. Uh, we, we reached out to a lot of people that were in the Shocker family, that were scouts, coaches, summer people, people well-versed. 
and Todd was a popular, popular choice. So we did go with Todd. But yes, Eric Wedge was definitely given that opportunity in 2013. Armand, do you got a question? You're on mute. You're on mute. Hey, tell us about, you know, your, um, you did a CD about, you know, several years ago about the, you know, the fundamentals of baseball and everything. Uh, tell us about that uh, a lot back that our, our, our listeners have, haven't even, uh, you know, about that. It was a very enjoyable CD that you, uh, that you had brought out when you were pitching coach at WSU. Hey, thanks for teaming me up on that. I like that. That's a good club <laughs> for me. I, I'm, I'm handing you questions to ask me. No, it was 2007. It's funny you ask, because I, I just got to ask to do a speaking engagement with a good friend, uh, which I'm going to try to put together in the next, you know, three or four weeks, hopefully when we're out of our quarantine. Uh, but he yeah. sent me a picture of the CD yesterday, and I laughed. I go, dude, no way you got that. But we're, the way that came about was I was speaking in Denver in December of 2006 and it was all my mental stuff you know it was a little bit mechanics but more my mental things that I'd done for a lot of years and a guy came up to me a guy named Steve Springer who had a CD called quality at bats and he's he's killed it in that you know promoting his CD and just giving speech speeches on the mental side of baseball and specifically hitting he came up to me after my speech and he said, hey, man, do you have a book? Do you have a CD? Do you have anything? I said, no, I don't. He said, man, you need to. He said, that's good stuff. So he had me all fired up. I can't sleep that night. I'm supposed to stay in Denver and get up early and drive back to Wichita the next day. I couldn't sleep. So at 2 in the morning, I checked out and drove back to Wichita. My mind's spinning. I think I might made it to Colby, and then I had to pull over and get a nap about 7 in the morning. <laughs> but anyway, what I did was I was speaking that next month in January in Wichita at the Marriott to the Kansas baseball coaches. And I, I, I had a professional guy come out and tape it. And he put it together. He cleaned it up a little bit. It's 42 minutes. It is a CD. I did that on purpose. I wanted the audio where people could drive around and listen to it. I've had a lot of my players say, hey, man, I, I listen to that when I'm running. You know, I, I download whatever, all these technical terms you guys are aware of that I'm not. But anyway, it was a huge success. I got tired of promoting it myself. So I have a guy now that does that, maybe the best promoter there is, a guy named Paul Reddick. So people that want that can Google Paul Reddick slash Brent Chemnitz and it will come up. You can still get it. Uh, he will send that to you. But it was very successful. I think I had like 21 or 22 of my tips that, uh, you know, I use in coaching that I put in a CD and had a lot of fun doing it. But I can't believe it. That was like 13 years ago. Wow. Yeah. Was, that's, that's outstanding. What is the one thing in that CD that you – thought that was the most important thing for especially young baseball players in transitioning into high school and well i appreciate that question and and you know i, I like i said i have like 21 or 22 things and anybody that knows me knows that i'm a mental guy when anybody says mm -hmm. that's nationwide on pitching oh he's a brain guy and i love that <laughs> i embrace that but what i tell people to kind of to answer your question, mechanics are important. I mean, you got to be under control. You got to get to a good position of balance or power, and you got to be able to throw out front downhill. But everybody gets there different. You're, not everybody's the same. You turn on a big league game, and you know you watch Randy Johnson or Glavin or Kershaw or whoever the key. Notice I put all left-handers out there since I was left-handed or am left-handed. Uh, but they're not. They don't look the same. So what you got to do is figure out what works for you. So I think the thing that is probably the number one thing I put in there is be who you are. Be the mm -hmm. best version of you. I, I can't tell you how many times I'd go watch a guy pitch in high school, and I was like, all this guy has to do is do what he's doing right now, and he will help us next year. But what happens is when guys go up a level, they try to do more than they're really comfortable with. 
or, you know, they'll try to throw too hard or they think they got to come up with another pitch. Now, with that being said, I always said, okay, we can teach you things to change up, kind of get you to repeat your delivery, whatever the case may be, but be the best version of you. So I think that's the point I get in there that's my favorite. And then I'm a big positive energy guy. I'm a big have fun guy. I'm a big guy on be able to have a sense of humor. One of the things I say in there is, hey, the only thing I can promise you is you're going to have adversity. How you deal with it is going to be the key. So that's kind of, you know, who I am. And, and I have to laugh at myself on this technology. Because I was driving Aaron crazy. I'm like, all right, dude. And when I hit this button, now what do I do? You know, my daughter's here. She's a freshman in college, and she's helping me. But the number one thing I get from, it, from GAs or people in my office when they come in to help me, and they are going to have to come in and help me, the number one thing I get is, dude, I've never seen this happen before. Because everybody says the same thing. Oh, it's simple. Trust me, man, it's simple. And I go, okay. It's not like I'm answering and saying hello. So I, I – and I bring that up because i got to be able to laugh at myself. And, and believe it or not, I am learning daily. All right, Adam, you got a question? Um, yeah, sorry for the technical difficulty on my end. So if I repeat the question that you were just kind of on – Sorry. Um, I was kind of wondering about how you went about recruiting different individuals. Um, Were you specifically looking at someone who maybe had a fastball and we can work on the off speed stuff? Or were you mainly looking for a guy who off speed and then we can work on the fastball, say? Like, what was your specifics and what you look for in a pitcher? Yeah, great question. my, my running joke on recruiting is, you know, when you get in, you start recruiting at 21, 22, you think you have all the answers. You're like, man, I'm going to revolutionize this. I know what I want to do. I, I get them all right. I nail my game. You want to tell everybody all the ones you get right. If I was uh, Gene Stevenson's recruiting coordinator for over 30 years, I was a pitching coach. And then the dug at Wichita State for 38 years. And you better have a sense of humor. Kind of, kind of like what I said, I was with Gene, 35 years, Todd Butler, three. Uh, you better be able to laugh at yourself. Nowhere more than in recruiting because you're not going to get them all right. I think the biggest key to recruiting is you figure out, obviously, you got to have talent. I, I tell everybody, kind of like what I just said on my, on my CD, at the Division One level, we're going to get talented, gifted guys, better than I was. As a, as a college pitcher. But the difference maker is going to be the brain. So we obviously tried to get guys that, uh, you know, had makeup, had arm strength. And, and I always try to do my homework. I'd talk to coaches. I'd, I'd get to the park early. I wanted to see who was out there early. I wanted to see who was out there, you know, trying to get everybody going. And you also didn't necessarily want to see it, but you'd see the guys that drug in late. The guys that, you know, you were kind of having to kick in the butt to get going. You tried to avoid those guys. You wanted those guys that were uplifting and, and go-getters, so to speak, team guys. Uh, and I say you want size you, if you could get it. But I was never hung up on size. I can tell you a lot of 5'11 pitchers that were pretty darn good. So, yeah, you know, the stereotype, I want a guy 6'3", 195, easy arm action, 90s. Of course, everybody wants those guys. And, you know, we had our share. We had nine first-round drafts that were pitchers. 17 of my guys pitched in the big leagues. So, we don't take a backseat to nobody on that. But I think makeup and just, you know, can he get better? Will he get better? Will he put in the time? Will he work? Uh, but, but that kind of comes back on you. You got to work too. And in the, in the summers, I feel guilty if I was sitting at home. It's like, all right, man, there's a Jayhawk League game over in El Dorado. I better get over there. I better see somebody. Or I, I better get down to Derby. They, they gotta, they're playing tonight. So you, you, you just put in your time, you put in your work, you do your homework. But it, it never seemed like work to me. It was always fun. If you're watching a game in the summer at a ballpark, is that really work? I don't think so. So I feel very blessed, but just put in your time, put in your work. Yeah. Uh, what are the most memorable recruits that you had at Wichita State? And what are, what are the one recruits that you had a near miss on, Brent? Well, 
It, you, everybody wants to talk about the ones that got right. You know, I love talking about Kenny Stainster because he didn't throw very hard by Division One standards. I went and saw him in a little town in Missouri, drove over there, watched him, drove back the same day. He's like 83, 85, but my gut told me we better get this guy, man. So what's he do? He goes 17 and 0 for us one year. Those were the years we were around all the time. You remember, first team All American actually pitched in the big leagues. Uh, Tommy Hottaby's another one. He didn't throw very hard. Left handed, low 80s. But the guy was a winner. Now he's a pitching coach for the Chicago Cubs. You you want to talk about those all day long. Yeah. Now, the ones you miss on, nobody wants to talk about, but you better have a sense of humor. I passed on Brad Penny. I mean, he's out of Broken Arrow, went on to pitch in the big leagues with several clubs with the Dodgers. And it's like, I see it. And, you know, he's big and he's got some size. I watched him pitch over at LaFortune Park in the summer of, oh, shoot, this has been mid-90s. He hit six dudes. And it wasn't on purpose. And it wasn't like he was busting him off the plate. He, he was recalling, and, and it's like, man, that's tough to fix. I see the size. I think he's going to throw hard, but I just don't know. It's not like I just said no, but in my own head, it's like, man, I got to see more. Well, he goes on, he signs. He's a high draft, signs out of high school. But I love saying, telling everybody, hey, I passed on Brad Penny. So, I mean, there's a few of those examples out there, but uh, the guys that act like they get them all right, they're lying to you. <laughs> We're all going to have some that we're like, oh, I can't believe I did that, but it happens. I want to ask you one question because I've been looking at this video nonstop. The game back in, I think it was late 80s, early 90s against the Miami Hurricanes in the World Series. Go back to that play where Phil Stevenson gets picked off at first. That trick play they did where the even the camera got confused because they thought the ball was going down the right field line. And then Phil got tagged out at second base. How mad was Gene Stevenson on that play? Well, that was that was actually the College World Series, our first trip in 1982. We'd gone to New Orleans. We won three there. As a pitching coach, I got to get this in. We gave up one run in three games. Uh, it's our first trip to Omaha, and we're playing Miami, and and we're loaded. I mean, we got the three All Americans on the mound. Like I said, we we gave up one run. Uh, in New Orleans, uh, we go to our first trip to Omaha. We have Phil Stevenson. We have uh, Russ Mormon, Charlie O'Brien right in the middle of the order. Jimmy Thomas led off. Lauren Hips, who led the nation and run scored that year. Still, still record. Uh, but that lineup was loaded. Great chemistry. Great lineup every day. I think Gene switched six and seven, and that was it. Spring and Pinner. If it was a left-hander, I think he hit spring uh, seventh. And if it was a right-hander, I think he hit Penner's seventh. But he flip-flopped. But the lineup was the same. Just a very solid, outstanding team. I think we won 87 games, still a record. But we're playing Miami. And Phil, and I actually tweeted this out because I get tired of seeing it every year. People will resurface that. And I know Phil's real tired of it. Because you got to have a sense of humor. And Billy Rona, the shortstop for Miami, is actually a really good friend. And he's a guy that, that tagged him out. So he loves talking about it, but we kind of get tired of it. But it was perfectly executed. Casper has, has steps off, fakes the throw. Everybody plays it out perfect. From what I understand, they had the back girls and everybody working on it, like in one of the practices in Omaha. In Omaha, your games are spread out, so the practices can get a little boring, so sometimes you just entertain yourself. I think part of it was as they were entertaining themselves, and part of it was like, all right, let's, say, let's put some time in and try to see if it'll work. Yeah. Well, it did, but to get back on track here, I actually tweeted out last week, let's don't lose sight of the fact Phil Stevenson was one of the best base dealers ever and might be the best offensive player in college baseball history. Just look at his numbers. So it can happen. It was well played. Uh, like I said, I know Phil gets real tired. They had it on yesterday. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, here we go again. And – it's it's one of those deals. It is amusing for people to watch, and we just got to kind of take it for that. But don't lose sight of the fact what a tremendous, tremendous player Bill Stevenson was. Ramon, Adam, any questions? What are your favorite players you coach in your tenure at, at Wichita State, Brad? Who was who was one of your favorite ones that 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 uh you had on your wing? 
Well, you know, I, if guys are going to listen, I can't get enough names in right here. I don't want to make anybody <laughs> mad, Armand. Uh, I don't know the players. I got to ask. This was actually in a tweet. I got on Twitter a year ago. I never thought I'd be that guy. But somebody asked, you know, if I ever thought I'd get back into coaching uh, and what I miss most about it. And the answer is I don't want to get back to coaching. I get the best job ever now. I'm assistant yeah. AD, and Darren Buttwright's a great boss. Alex Johnson's awesome. So now I travel with basketball. I'm involved with all the sports. So I don't see myself getting back into coaching. Eric Wedge actually came to me when he was running the minor leagues for Toronto in 2016. It was the summer that I moved over to development and asked me. He said, you know, I could have gone to work for him. I said, man, I, thank you, but I think I'm going to love doing what I'm doing. And that has definitely panned out. And he knows that. And, and we, we, we spun it on him. We got him here. But anyway, I told him, I said, I, I absolutely love doing what I'm doing. So to get to your question, the thing you miss the most about coaching are the relationships. Yeah, I mean, you know, you had some great teams. Obviously, we know we won it in 89. You, you remember, you know, a, a lot of the memories. But the thing you miss are the relationships. So for me to pin down one guy would be impossible. I just felt like I was blessed. I was around college guys every day. So what it did was make me think that I was in college. My brain never grew up. Hey, to this day, I still think I'm 22, 23. Now my body <laughs> tells me different. But just what a great run. So many great memories. But I, I, I'd love to give you a guy or two, but then I'd just start going wouldn't be able to quit. How about this? Wedge is one of my favorites. He, he's, the, he's the guy now. He's the skipper. His pitching coach, Mike Pelfrey, is right there. So those guys, and, and I'm going to add one more because he's on the staff. I'm making it easy. I always love Lauren Hibbs. He's the director of operations. He was an assistant on our national championship staff, uh, played here in 82 and then had a very successful run as a head coach for 27 years at Charlotte. Those three, uh, I love all three of those guys, so I'm being real, real political right here because <laughs> those guys are with us right now. Yeah. Adam, do you have one last question for him? Yeah, I do. Um, I was just kind of curious. Uh, say a pitcher's, like, really struggling, like nothing's working. How did you get them to, like, refocus and just kind of help them through – that process to help be successful for you guys if you couldn't take the guy out yeah i mean obviously the easy way is go to another pitcher but you always want to try to get him to fight through it to grind through it once again that's where wedge was so good as a catcher he could motivate those guys he could get guys back in sync i think there's a lot of things that that do the work it doesn't always work but I think what one of my big deals and it's on the CD getting back to Armand's question I think next pitch is one of my favorites what I always talk to guys about is don't overplay the moment in your head you know there's a lot of coaches and, and people say oh the first inning's the biggest the fifth inning the ninth inning or the one one pitch I, I, I try to stay away from all that because I'm like okay is the second inning not important or is the eighth inning not important or is a one-two pitch not important, or two-one, whatever the case. I was a big next pitch. What's the most important pitch of the game? The one you got in your hand, yeah. the next pitch. So I was really big on pace. I was really big on clear your mind. You, you, I always had a deal, okay, after each pitch, we got to have pace. Work fast, those strikes, change speed. Pound the zone. That's going to help your defense. But – Get up there, kind of have a trigger mechanism in your brain where good or bad, all, you can, all you're worried about is the next pitch. And breathe. Take a deep, deep breath. Get a trigger mechanism. So I think what that did was alleviate, okay, I'm struggling or start thinking too much. And, and once again, you know, when people think about me, they say, well, he's a brain guy. Well, a lot of that traces back to me as a, as a pitcher. I got my own head too much. I would overthink it. You look at a – say you look at, look at a box score and somebody walks three guys during a seven-inning stint. How many times are those walks back-to-back? -back? It's yeah. because they were thinking balls and strikes. So don't ever think balls and strikes. Here's your little tip as a coach if you're coaching your kids along the way. Don't ever get in your head, hey, just those strikes. That's negative energy. 
pound the zone, worry about one thing, worry about throwing to the glove and the ball that's in your hand. Yep. All right, before we close well, out, I, I do want to say one thing, and I want to ask you one question. All the years of going out to games, I've noticed when you walk out, you're going out there for the pitcher, but I've also noticed when you walk out there and you're going slow as a turtle, everybody knew you were going out there for the umpire. So can you just explain those times like where you just told the pitcher, I'm not out here for you, I'm here for the umpire, and then when the umpire comes up, you say something, and then you got tossed out of the game? <laughs> well, I did get thrown out of a few. It's funny, in 2016, when I moved over to development, there was a, a photographer that that summer, I saw him and I go, dude, man, every time you took pictures of me, you, you, which were in the Eagle, I was going crazy. I said, <laughs> you know, I'm a pretty good, happy-go-lucky guy. And he said, well, those aren't very entertaining. I said, well, you have got to get those pictures for me. So it took him a while, but he got the pictures and I put them into, a, I could have put them in a drawer, but I went to Hobby Lobby and there were like 15 <laughs> pictures of me going crazy on umpires. And I have it in my office. And I shot that out to a bunch of people. And the number one response I got back from my pictures was not a dude, you're crazy. It was like, thank you. You always had our back. Well, here's my deal. When I go to the mound, I tell the pitcher, I'd say, all right, are you getting squeezed? Well, I would normally say yes. Well, I'd ask catcher, I'd say, is he getting squeezed? Yes. Because if he said no, well, then I got nothing. Or sometimes I'd pull the infielders in there. But if they all said yes, he's getting squeezed. And another element to that was my guy had to be right around the plate. If he was everywhere, I wasn't going to get on the umpire because it was like, see, if you do a strike, he was stunned. But if you were a pitcher that was right around the zone, you weren't whining, you weren't showing that bar up, which was another big deal of mine. It was like, dude, I got it. Okay. And then if an upper had a little bit of attitude, like we're not talking balls and strikes. Well, if my guy's right around the zone, and he's not showing him up. My catcher's not showing him up. It's my job to defend him. So once I got all those in play, I'd say, all right, well, here's the deal. If this guy shows any attitude at all, I'm getting tossed. I said, don't get caught up in it. Right after this is done, you got to, you know, this next hitter, whatever the case may be, struggles with fastball in. Uh, hey, try the third to first. I think we'll catch him off guard. But don't get caught up in me. You got to worry about the hitter. I would say all those things. And I said, all right, let me know when he's getting here. And they'd all have their glove over like, oh, my God, this is going to be good. So if they get out there, I go, are you serious? You're, are you, why are you squeezing my guy? And if a guy said, look, man, I'm struggling, Brent, stay with me, well, it defused me immediately. Well, if they got defensive and wanted to go at it, well, it was on. So I, I would go crazy. I'd get my guys back. Now, keep in mind, it was like, I'll do it so you don't have to. Well, I got thrown out my fair share. But the funny thing about, once again, this on Twitter yesterday, a couple of umpires were chiming in. And I was like, yeah, people would have, it would have blown fans away if they would have known we were actually great friends, which was the case. Leave it on the field. Now, my last several years, I mean, if you went crazy enough, not only were you going to get tossed, you were going to get another game. And then sometimes they'd even run the manager for a game. So that kind of took the fun away. Because in the heydays back in the 90s and 2000s, if you got ran, it was, that was it. And I was expendable. It's like, I, at least I can get a little energy in the dugout. And people love that. So, yeah, I, I, I get asked about that a lot. Uh, and traveling with basketball and this and being around a lot of the boosters, they go, dude, I knew exactly what you were going to do when you came to the mound. And you just said it. So it's funny how many people had the same mindset you did. Yeah. All right. Well, Brent, we want to. Hey. Oh, you got one more quick question, Armand. Yeah, yeah, have sure. one more quick question. Tell, tell us about your new role as the, the assistant AD for Wichita State, right? Now, what 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 are your uh, what what is exactly what you do for uh, you know for them? I got the best job ever. Travel with basketball. We take donors on most trips. Absolutely love those guys. Uh, Greg's an amazing coach. Obviously, got to know the assistants. The work they put in is amazing, and they're, they're just so down to earth, so real. Uh, so I travel with them. We had a couple of projects going. Uh, if you go over to Wichita State, the Coke Arena has a success center. I had a little, a little involvement in helping raise money for that. That was mainly Alex Johnson and, and some people at the foundation and Darren Boatwright. Uh, but my baby was X Stadium. 
phase five. I mean, that had been on hold, the clubhouse and the new weight room and, and locker facility and all those things, the offices. So that was my big push the last three or four years. Um, it's awesome. You need to come take a tour if you get a chance. So I was heavily involved in that. And then the thing that my official title is assistant AD for outreach and staff development, but staff development about, oh, five, six times a year, I'll address the whole staff, all the coaches, all the staff. One time it may be what defines culture, positive energy, how do you deal with adversity, what makes top CEOs successful, what makes top coaches successful. And I just kind of get on a soapbox for about 30, 40 minutes. So I, I wear a lot of hats, but uh, one, of the, one of the main things, I just try to make Alex Johnson and Darren Boatwright's jobs easier. So in some cases, I'm a special assistant to the AD and, and also Alex Johnson, which, hey, that's all me, man. I'm a promoter, positive energy, life's beautiful. Well, Brent, we miss you as a baseball, as a pitching coach, and you had a wonderful career. And we just want to take this time to thank you for coming on our show today and we love you as a Wichita State Shocker, and we just hope that you continue to keep doing what you're doing. Hey, I appreciate it. And I can't thank you enough for, you know, asking me to come on and also putting up with me. My technology slowly headed <laughs> in the right direction, as long as I have some teenagers and young 20 types around to, to help me out. But thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Appreciate it. Tell the family I said hi, Brent. Perfect. They love you. Pal. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for our show today. Go ahead and push the like button and the subscribe button on the bottom right screen. And we will see you guys next time. We will have Will Keinkel on. He is covering the Carolina Panthers, and he used to do the TV news sports here in Wichita, Kansas. So we will have him on tomorrow. And we hope you guys enjoy tomorrow's show. Thank you.